We're getting towards the end of the Isaiah series, and I've been skipping some chapters. Admittedly, I've been finding a lot of Logan's favorite chapters in Isaiah. True prayer, though, I believe. But we're only going to do a couple, maybe a, a few more sermons in Isaiah. Now we're at Isaiah 55. But I think things are adding on, piling on in this series, and hopefully as we pro uh, progress through it, we're realizing some of this progress. And then now we're at a point in our lives where maybe this, that Isaiah 6 call, whom shall I send, maybe it's making more sense to us. And the idea that God is calling you. And I hopefully, I hope that us in this room, we have a heart that wants to be used to God. That's kind of where my progression is now. We've talked about all the sins in the world. We've talked about the beauty of the gospel. And now God is asking people to share the gospel. Yes. To do their part. The service of the Lord. And so that's a starting point. Who does God send? Today we're going to talk about that. Types of people. Characteristics for who God would send into his work. Of course, at the start of it, I'll ask you, do you want to be used of God? Then here's how to set yourself up in position to be used of God. Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2. We'll first do a little bit of introduction. Isaiah 55, verse 1 says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money, without price. It says to buy these things, but then it says those that have no money. <laughs> so you, you need these things, you're thirsty, but you've got no money. Two, wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken, hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. This message in verse 1 and 2, talking about how we have, we're thirsty, we have need of nourishment, of water, of food. But spiritual nourishment is something that cannot be bought. It doesn't cost a dime, and if you had a billion dimes, they wouldn't help you buy spiritual nourishment anyway. Spirituality cannot be bought. A walk with the Lord cannot be bought. Salvation cannot be bought or worked for in any way, shape, or form. We know that. This tells us that. And this, these two verses are directly in line with what Jesus said. Remember Jesus, let me read Jesus' words in John 6, 35 and 36. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also see me, and believe not. People in this life are still too busy with that temporal bread. Temporal water, like the woman said, She'd give me that water that I thirst not again. We need to thirst spiritual things, yeah. eternal things. Yeah. Get beyond this daily life that we live. When we start looking into that life that beyond this life, then we can be used of God. Used of God to deliver this message of how Christ does fill lives. Yeah, how that is the abundant life. How that is eternal life when we look at Jesus Christ and what he did. Those things I only say as a prelude to the message this morning, which I think we'll pick up in about verse 6. Verse 6. Again, the question is, who does God send? Who does God use? Today I want to look at four characteristics, and if you've been with us through the Sunday school, then you already have a good inclination for what they are. Again, it's not all inclusive, but here are four characteristics of who God would actually use. I think we see one in verse 6. Chapter 55, verse 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. A characteristic, and we're going to jump back and forth between characteristics today, but a characteristic of who God sends and uses are those who acknowledge and obey the Spirit of God. Yes. I want to start with that point, because at that point, that is how one comes to salvation, obeying God and telling it on your heart. And you've heard me... Preach this verse, have you not? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. We talked about in Sunday school, we are trying to spell out what that sanctification means. How you're set apart for the Holy Ghost to work in your life and prick your heart. Well, I, I want to say, as we said in Sunday school, that that's not something that happens all life long. God talks to your heart. He draws near to your heart. He's speaking to your heart. And I say, call upon him then for salvation. That moment God's talking to her, don't take it to the bank that that tugging may always be there. Because it might not be. It might not be. God may pass on to the next target who he's going to sanctify and prick their heart, talk to their heart. 
Don't take for granted that tugging at your heart. Call upon God when He's near. And then, not just for salvation, then also for service. I want us to be a people, a church, that is in touch with the Holy Spirit leading. In real tangible ways. I think you know me, I'm not talking about a Holy Spirit leading that's going to cause you right now to jump up and speak in tongues. That's, that's goofy. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit leading that's going to have you lay hands on someone and heal them and just touch them. That's goofy, okay? But there is a, a real Holy Spirit, an entity that does direct our paths. We're going to talk about that this morning. I want us to be people in tune with the Holy Spirit's leading. How we can identify it, feel it, act on it. What God is telling us to do, the Spirit of God. Look at verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Another characteristic of someone who's set apart, ready for God to use them, is that they forsake sin. It says in verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way. We as a people need to get out of sin. Pretty one-on-one -on -one there, isn't it? Basic concept, get out of sin. But not just get out of sin. Here, I love 8 and 9. It talks about stop doing things your way. That's another thing that holds you back. You may not be just in some gross sin in your life, but you may just be in something that you think is the right way. You know, it's pretty smart. I'm pretty smart. Always done it. It's my tradition. I'm used to doing it. I'm going to do it this way. Those can hold you back just as easily as sin can. Those can be the weights that easily beset you in life. To be ready for God's use is to forsake sin and forsake your own way. This passage, we read it a lot, don't we? The heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And In my um, simple mind, I've read through this passage a thousand times, and I always just kind of equate it to, well, there's my way and there's God's way. And they're just different ways, right? And it does say that, but this passage does it not imply that God's ways are immensely better than our ways? Yeah. Higher than our ways? Yes. I was thinking about that in terms of the heavens are higher than the earth. I looked this up. Do you know that the Hubble Space Telescope, it can see 13 billion light years away into the sky? 13 billion light years? That's, I don't know what that is. That's a long ways. I don't, I don't want to think about it. That's a long, 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 long ways above our ways here on earth. That's what it says. God's ways are so much better than our ways. But we as people, what do we do? Uh, we stick to the plan. Stick to our plan. Right. We've got this thing that we've always done. It's worked before. We're going to keep doing it. Double down on it. Because it's what we do. It's what we know. We need to drop our ways. Look for something better. Right? Give ourselves, give our lives up. What we think was so good in our lives. What we think we can't give up. And just drop it. And look for that better way. The Bible tells us here. Another characteristic of those who are set apart and ready to be used of God, can we think can be seen right here in verse 10 and 11. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. I want to tell you this morning that those who are ready to be used of God are those who feast upon His Word. And it shouldn't be a marvel for us. Who would God send forth as an ambassador? Somebody who knows the message. I think in life sometimes we wonder, God, why aren't you using me in a bigger way? God, you know, why aren't you calling me to speak to more people? And then God's in heaven saying, well, you haven't even read the letter yet. Then you're supposed to deliver. You don't understand it. You didn't look at it. You looked at it one time in passing. I want you to understand the message. Get deep down, rooted in your heart. Feast on my word. And then, yeah, you're ready to deliver it. You know it front and back. And we're asking God why he doesn't send us. And God's saying, well, why don't you have read the message? Not just read it, but apply it to your life, too. I can't send out a hypocrite. I can't send someone out to preach sin, righteousness, and judgment when you haven't brought that in your own heart. That's supposed to begin at the house of God. Those who feast on God's word are those who are setting themselves up to be used as ambassadors for Christ. Matthew 4, 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 
We are to live this Bible. Yes. And this Bible. And it says every, every, word, every, every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That means, yeah, that means old and new, but I'm not just talking about that. I'm saying, digging in here for what God's telling you. Live by every word of God. If you're like me, I kind of have a tendency just to go to my favorite passages, which I'm all for. Find your favorite Psalms, your favorite New Testament passages, your go-tos that pick you up when you're down, that um, you know, get your mind straightened back up again. But dig deeper. And that's why you come to Sunday school. That's why in Sunday school we're covering some obscure passages. Because they're God's word. And we're to live by every word of God. And rightly divide the word of truth. Yes. Our world and our churches suffer from a very surface level understanding of the Bible. It's the blessings are to be found as we dig into it and we feast on it. Amen. Look at 12. 12. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In verse 11, don't you always view verse 11 as I view it? The idea that God's word will accomplish what we want to accomplish, kind of with that external facing view. Like I always think, when I give the, the track out to somebody, you know, that'll accomplish what it needs to accomplish. The gospel will go forth, right? When I'm preaching, God's word will have his way, right? Even if I don't understand God's word will have his way. All those things are true. But I think we need to read our Bibles in private with the same idea. It, it'll accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. It applies to us too. When we're reading the word of God, we need to, with faith, understand that it's going to do what God wants it to do. This isn't just a, I'm not just reading some Reader's Digest magazine. This is going to impact my heart. And if we have that mentality, maybe we'll pick it up even more often. Amen. Maybe we'll read a little bit longer. Maybe we'll look a little bit closer for God. What are you telling me? I know this isn't just a shallow you know, exercise I'm doing this morning. Amen. This evening, this night, whatever. Now it's in verse 12. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you and the singing. And all the trees and the fields shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. It shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This last point I'd like us to think about this morning. Who does God use? Well, those who have faith in who God is. Those who have faith in who God is. Those who think that God can still move mountains. That they can break forth with singing. The trees can clap their hands. Those who, as it says in verse 13, aren't the Johnny Rain Clouds. I'm sorry. There's a, there's a mentality in Christianity, and I mean this among good brethren. I mean, people of the word. There's a mentality, I've heard it said a thousand times, that, well, this person's just never going to get right. Or this is just never going to change. You heard that? And trust me, I'm, I kind of fall in that category. The people who say that, like, this person just can't get right. They're not going to get right. The people who say those things are pessimists, yeah. <laughs> I tend to be a pessimist. A pessimist is really someone who's really just pretty objective and logical, and they've seen it go wrong so many times, right? That's a pessimist. I kind of fall in that category sometimes. Just, I've seen it happen before. I want to tell you a pessimist is a practical thing, but I want to tell you a pessimist is a bad thing for sharing the gospel. A pessimist is a bad thing for being a Christian. Really is. Really is. Because it, you're completely leaving one supernatural factor out of the equation. It's God Almighty. Amen. Praise God. It's God Almighty. So while, yeah, in my workplace, I might be a pessimist sometimes. When I'm at home, you know, doing some job, like working on a car or something, I might be a pessimist sometimes. But when God's in the equation, blow, throw your logic out the window. Yes. Don't be a pessimist anymore. Amen. Don't limit God. Here, the idea is, you know, we're going to plant these seeds, but all is going to come up. We're going to be thorns. Just going to be enough. We're going to plant the seeds of the gospel, and all of a sudden we come up, people are going to hate us. Well, you know, that might happen 99 times. But maybe that hundredth time, maybe it doesn't. Yeah. Maybe God works a miracle in that life when we see something happen. Amen. God can't use the pessimists. God can't use those who limit who he is. We're going to preach on that. All these points we're going to, we're going to cover in more detail. But I just want to say that if we're the people who think that we're going to plant seeds and, and briars are going to come up every time, Thorns are going to come up every time. And we don't think God can work. God just might tell us, hey, sit down. I'm going to use somebody else who actually believes I can do things. Right. We don't want to be Christians who are not sober. And um, Christians who aren't circumspect and careful and vigilant and understand that this battle is fierce. And that most people are going to reject the gospel, hate the Christian. But we also don't want to be 
the pessimistic Christian who doesn't believe God can't work. That's right. Or we preach a gospel and people sense it. Yes. You you preach in that that God is real and God can save, but I don't really see it coming out of your life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like you believe the Bible. I think the world can sense it. More than that, though, I believe God is disappointed in it, that we limit Him, we be faithless. Let's talk about that in a little bit. Would you please go to the New Testament? It's a really simple sermon. I think it's going to be a really short one, so you can clap about that. Maybe the trees can clap your hands about that. But look at 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. Simple sermon, really just revolving around those four points, being set apart, being sanctified, uh, being ready to be used of God. And this passage here talks about a lot of it. 2 Timothy chapter 2. First, I want to cover the two points that say those who forsake sin in their own way and those who feast on God's word are ready to be used of God. And you'll see as I, can, as I progress through this, you see about every one of my points also tie to the idea of getting out of sin because it's just what the Bible tells us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able also to teach unto others also, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I want to remind us this morning that we are called to be soldiers. And it says in verse 4, No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I don't know how else to preach it other than how it's written. The idea that a soldier's got to get themselves untangled from the world, or you're never going to be deployed. Never going to be ready to go out to the battle, to face the foe, join the fray. Never going to get there if you're still in sin. So it's a very simple concept. You want to be used to God, must get out of sin. Let's skip all the way, if you would, to verse 15. Here's the idea of those who feast on God's word. 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We did that this morning. Right? Praise God. We try to look at some difficult concepts or just some deep concepts in Scripture. But it's needful to know the message that you're supposed to deliver. We need to get in God's Word. Study it day and night. Again, God doesn't send messengers who don't know the message. 16 says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth the canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. There is a lot of vain babbling in the year 2019, almost 2020. And I think, of a, I think of a hundred things. Not just in churches, not just wrong doctrines. I just mean what the world talks about. Mm -hmm. well, we're also busy. Someone mentioned um, news stations this morning. And you turn on the news, I'm sorry, there's hardly news. It's just all vain babblings. People's opinions, people's agendas, what people want us to see and hear. And then you get commercials on there and you start thinking about products. It's all just vain badness. You get on social media, and we try to use social media for the glory of God, but there's so much vanity on social media. Every post just of something vain to get you thinking about something that's not Bible. A lot of wasted time we spend on vain badness. And they increase under more ungodliness. It does, isn't it? Not compete. Can we even put our finger in our lives how right now there's a competing <laughs> reality in your life of, oh, I'm going to read this vain bad thing or I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes thinking about this vain thing or I'm going to go to God in prayer. I'm going to go to church on Sunday morning or I'm going to do something that just involves vain bad things. Again, I can pick on football again. People talk all week long about the big games. And then Sunday morning we watch the big games. That's the epitome of vain bad things. And I'm a sports fan but it's the epitome of vain babbling. Yeah. Christian friend, are we spending too much of our time on vain babblings? Don't ever be one of those. There are Christians, I think well-meaning Christians, who think about end times things as well. And we should be. We're supposed to be looking for the coming of the Lord. But there are also about 99 out of 100 things that, in that vein that are vain babblings. Yes. Of people who don't have a clue. They're just saying this conspiracy theory, that conspiracy theory, you know, this, uh, this, 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 and they're all vain. I like to think about end times things, but if they're not firmly rooted in Scripture, and they're just more deeply rooted in someone's conspiracy theory, it's a vain battle. You're yeah. wasting your time. Yeah. Wasting your time. It says that their word eats as of the canker, these vain babblings. Nah, it destroys your life. Get you into more and more godliness. 
who concerning the truth of Aaron saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrew the faith of some. These people, Hymenaeus and Philetus, I'm sorry, they're just YouTube conspiracy theorists. They're saying, you know what, the resurrection is already past. It's already done. Yeah, it's, already, it's already over. They're just conspiracy theorists. And they've got people following them, wasting their lives. 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands as sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. It's a powerful verse, isn't it? Again, the simple message is to get out of sin. But here it tells us why get out of sin? Because you have Christ's name on your back. And you're dragging it through the mud. Get out of sin. It says in verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of herb, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and set apart, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I like this verse. Let's look at it for a second. That word meet just simply means suitable. Meet for the master's use. It means suitable for the master's use, for his work. I named my sermon this morning for the master's use. And I want to ask us as Christians, are we suitable? Or we meet the master's use. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means that we can actually be used for something. Amen. We're prepared enough, ready enough to be used for God's work. We're appropriate for the cause. Amen. We're not inappropriate. That word suitable is like that word appropriate. Inappropriate. Can God consider you an option to deliver that message to your family? To be that pillar in a local church? Can God consider you the option to stand for faith, stand as a lighthouse in the year 2019? Or are we not even an option to God? And that's what we're talking about this morning. It says, and prepared unto every good work. I love the fact that it says unto every good work. We're prepared, we're ready. But we're ready for anything. You know, I use baseball now just because it's the one sport I played as a kid, and, and um, I guess just I try to use it for God's glory ground illustrations. But I wasn't that good of a baseball player, right? I played a lot of baseball. I was on a lot of good teams, but I wasn't that good. But I would get a lot of playing time. You know why? Because my approach wasn't understanding. I'm not as good as these other 15 guys. But I'll play anywhere, coach. Put me in right field, put me in left field, whatever. Put, put me anywhere, I just, I'll play. And but there were other people who were really good, right? And the shortstops, you know, you'd have, I'd play on like the all-star teams or these legion teams, and they'd be like, every one of them would be shortstops, right? So they came from all the other teams and they joined the team. They're all the shortstop, right? The, the most talented kid. So that's where they want to play. So they come to the team saying, I'm just going to play. I'm a shortstop. And the coach senses that that's all they want. So they don't get as much playing time because they don't want to play in that one position. They want the chief spot where the talented kid's supposed to be, right? Well, a lot of times I get more playing time than they would because they only want that one position. I think God does look at that in Christian service. Yes. And he sees those who just want the chief jobs. Those who just, you know, God... Just let me be the one that's just going to lead this person to the Lord. And I'd walk him right through it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray to the Lord, and i get all the glory for it. I mean, it'd be great to lead someone to the Lord. I, I love it. It's a joy. But God has other work to do, too. Not to, not to be disdainful, not to be rude, but God has bathrooms that need cleaned in his local church. God has simple things that he wants you to stand on. How about before we lead someone to the Lord, how about we just stand up in that circle that we are in, and actually say that, hey, circle, you know, that thing's a sin, it's wrong. And no, you didn't lead anyone to the Lord by doing that, but you just stood up, and you're faithful to that job. Yes. Christians need to um, crawl before they walk. They need to walk before you can run. It's like David's progression from the lions and the bears to Goliath. God wants to see faithfulness in little things. He does. It's a true concept. And so, who all in the room wants to be that person who's on bent knee with somebody leading them to the Lord? I want to be that person. You do want to? But let us do the little things first. The faithful things. Some of those things are definitely, as I say, um, service, where God would have you serve, and also standing, where God would have you stand. Stand up. Say something's right or wrong. You can't do that. Good luck leading someone to the Lord. It says, prepare it into every good work. Prepare it into every good work. You're ready for God to use you, whether it be cleaning the bathrooms or preaching the gospel. You're there. Amen. An option. 
Let's look at Romans chapter 8. We're asking who does God use, and we're asking, do we want to be used of God? I do. Romans 8, 1. Another way to set yourself apart and be ready for the Master's use is here in Romans 8, spelled out very clearly. Again, we'll see, to be used of God, you need to forsake sin and your own way, and then you need to obey the Spirit of God. To obey the Spirit of God. Let's talk about that in this chapter. 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This is a deep passage. And I want to start with this idea. It says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, right? Who are saved. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's no condemnation. That means you're not in trouble. Okay? But flip it. As logically you're allowed to do. So if it says, it would say there is condemnation for those who walk in the flesh, but not in the Spirit. That means that you are upsetting your master. Yes. That means there is condemnation. God's saying you're wrong. You're my servant, bought with my blood, but you're just walking after the flesh, doing what you want to do, serving your way, what you think is best. There is condemnation. We'll see that by the end of this section. Verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It's a very true principle that when you are born again, the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you can change. And you should change. And how is that possible? Through the Spirit of God. Amen. That's how a new creature happens. When we read the words, uh, a new creature, all things are passed away, all things are come. You truly, when you get born again, are a new creature. You've got this whole new element to you, this spiritual element called the Spirit of God Amen. dwelling in your heart. Amen. Which means you can overcome things that were never possible before. You can, you can absolutely kick bad habits, bad philosophies, things that you've always got wrong just because you've always done them. Through the power of the Holy Spirit you can get out of sin. The problem is, as we'll see here in a second, um, well, let's read it, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are of the spirit, they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When you become born again, you have the spirit. You can overcome things, but you, now you've got this conflict, this battle within your soul between the flesh and the spirit, between the flesh and the spirit. And we've preached about this before. You can learn a lot from this. With thought. One, if you don't have the battle, if you just constantly are just giving into the flesh, then you've got to ask yourself, do I have the spirit? And some around you are kind of wondering the same thing. Is there actually a conflict there? Is there a fight? The Christian life is very much a battle. A battle in this wicked world and a battle in your own heart. A tug of war between choosing what's right and wrong. And as other preachers have said, that battle within your heart, the victor often goes to the victory often goes to whoever has been being fed the best. Who's getting more nutrients? You know? You feed your carnal nature with sin and the things and the cares of this world. You feed that flesh. And that's what you're thinking about, that's what you're doing, so it's winning. While your spiritual nature is fed by the word of God, by the preaching of the word of God, by faith in his promises, by obedience. You feed one or the other. And if you feed the, the carnal nature, it's going to win. You're going to live a life of death. A life of death here means good for nothing. Wasted life. A life of destruction. Of scattering, not gathering. That's the concept. That's the struggle in your heart. And I want to ask you, who's winning in your heart? Amen. Who's winning in your heart? To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. The one who's letting the carnal nature of their body when it is death, as I said, destructive. You're bringing life to nobody. Bring the gospel to nobody. Meanwhile, those who are spiritually minded, they exude, they bring life wherever they go. They exude life and peace because they're living the life that Christ would have them live. 
They're demonstrations of Christ. Their words testify of the Savior. It says in verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can be. 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I'm a simple preacher. I just read the Word of God. It says that when you're living in a life backslidden in the flesh, you are at enmity with God. Yes. That means you're opposing God with your life. We talk about that. Before you get saved, right? Your father's the devil, and you are an easy enemy of God. But did you know, Christian friend, that when you feed the flesh, when you live in the flesh, you're also opposing God yet again? Yes. You're opposing Him again. And it says there you cannot please God. You cannot please God. The Christian has the luxury of the Holy Ghost. The Christian has the luxury of the Word of God that convicts us. Amen. It should convict us. You know when you were a kid and you, um, when you made your parents mad, right? And they were mad at you? It's not a good place to be, right? You did something wrong. And they're, they're mad at you and you're still walking disorderly. And there wasn't much peace. I mean, if you're decent, I guess if you were real hell, you just got used to doing that, maybe get used to it. But if you, if you wanted to be an okay kid, if, it would nag at you. My parents are mad at me, I did something wrong. My parents are mad at me, I did something wrong. I can see that in my kids' lives. They want to please their parents again. Well, Christians, I hope we have hearts like that. Yes. We don't want to walk disorderly against God. We want to please God in our lives. We know when He's mad at us. That's why you have altar calls. Amen. You come forward, you pray with God immediately, you hear something's wrong. You don't want to stand in opposition to Almighty God. That's why you have personal Bible studies. Make sure you're walking with the Lord. Renew and right spirit in your heart. Let's look at verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Which takes me to, this leads me to believe that if you don't have that struggle, as I said before, you're not even saved. You don't even feel the struggle going on. 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. By his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. I read through a lot of verses. For sake of time, we're not going to come on every one. But this verse 13, I think, is important. It relates to that condemnation we saw in verse 1. It says, For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. The Christian life is one of mortifying the deeds of the body. Amen. Knocking off those rough edges that we have. Getting out of sin, getting out of our own way. And that's how you live, the Christian life. If you don't do those things, you live a spiral of destruction. They say here, they call it death. Not to lose your salvation. But it's a wasted life. Amen. Wasted life of a Christian. Those who do not obey the Spirit of God that's, that's perfectly inside you, perfectly directing you, but you're not obeying. What is the Spirit of God? How can we sense it? The Spirit of God is something that it surpasses all logic. I felt it on my... It's, it's, it truly, it's felt in conviction more often than not. It's, it's hard for me to describe, but do, you under, do we understand the feeling of the Holy Spirit? And someone has said it, and I'm trying to speak accurately to what the Bible teaches. Someone has said that the Spirit of God is more of a, a leading than a driving. The Spirit of God is more of, it's kind of like I was talking about how I want to take on this ministry, possibly at the children's home, where I don't feel compelled to do it. There's no desire as far as, I'm going to get rich on this thing, or, you know, this is really cool, I'm going to get fame for it. I'm not being driven. It's more of, it seems like it's just happening. Kind of like how we landed in this building, how I became a preacher, how you sit where you sit. It just kind of just led in this direction. Yeah. That's the Holy Spirit's leading, you know? How people in this room have, have ended up sitting here this morning. Yeah. That's the Holy Spirit's leading. A driving is more of your concoction. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go join this church because it's a good church. It's a cool church. You know, I've got friends there. I'm going to drive. I'm going to get this occupation. I'm going to be whatever, a doctor, and it's going to happen. And you drive it. You force it. 
And this is Holy Spirit's leading just kind of lets, lets things fall into place. Amen. Lean not in the line of standing, always acknowledge Him, and He shall direct that path. God has a way of just leading. It is that pillar of cloud analogy, isn't it? Amen. It leads. I'm sure that pillar in the sky didn't move at a, at a cheetah pace, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the pillar in the sky just kind of just went along slowly. And then as we commented this morning, sometimes it stops. And you just stay right where it is in your life. And it leads you to some hard places, I'm sure, but you got God with you. It leads you to some pleasant places like the promised land, but you got God with you. Holy Spirit's leading. I'm trying to, I'm trying to help us identify it in our head without getting away from Scripture. I don't believe we have. But feel it. That still small voice in your life. Still small voice. Not banging it with a head, although sometimes it can certainly convict you and bring you to your knees. But it's telling you, hey, Pat, hey, Logan, hey, Cece, this is something wrong in your life. It needs to change. This is what you should be thinking about over here. Mm-hmm. It's a real thing, a tangible thing. And you won't hear it unless you're in God's Word and you're praying to God. Mm-hmm. Let us be in tune with, with obeying the Spirit of God. And, and to close, it truly is my last passage. I want to look at Mark chapter 9. Mark 9, the last um, of the characteristics I'd like to bring out, to be set apart, to be ready, to be used of God. You need to forsake sin in your own way and have faith in who God is. Forsake sin in your own way and have faith in who God is. This was convicting for me, and I trust it is what God has me, would have me bring forward this morning. Kind of again tying to that pessimistic Christian attitude that sometimes we fall into. Mark 9, let's look at verse 14. And, it came, and when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnashes with his teeth, and pineth the way, and I speak to thy disciples, and I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him, he, excuse me, he answereth him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? For how for long how long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. When they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway he the spirit terror him, and he fell on the ground and wallowing, foaming, and he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. It's Jesus talking. Forgive me for my stumbling reading there. Jesus here is wanting to know how long has this child been possessed, the devil. This devil is causing this child to foam on the ground, um, kick and scream, writhe, tear. This is a real problem that has existed in this community, in this family, in this child. This child is very much a child of the devil. Which you'll see that throughout Scripture. You'll see it in the old times. The devil's tactics seem to be this in line. A lot of ways he would, the demons would come and possess people, which is biblical. I know the world's going to think that, well, in that case, that's what the Bible says. I certainly believe it. The de- demons back then would go in and possess people. Demon possession. And this is how it would... Uh, manifest itself, people would live crazy lives like the maniac in the era who went around cutting himself and wore no clothes which always, I always say that that's an indication that nakedness is wrong <laughs> the demons are doing it but demon possession in the Bible is usually always this outward manifestation of a crazy, sporadic, wicked, wicked life right? I say that just to juxtapose it to today where I think the devil used a new tactic for demon possession and where now the demon possessed people are usually the polished people Beautiful smiles behind pulpits in beautiful buildings. The devil changed his tactics over the years. He realized, hey, people, if they saw all that kind of demon possession, it would show my cards. Everybody would know, oh, there is a real devil, a real God. Right? I think he changed tactics. He's smart. Yes. Today it's more subtle demon possession than it is like this. But back then, this is the problem. They want to get it fixed. Jesus asked them the question, how long has this problem existed? And they say since he was a child. That sounds like a, quite a while. That's what it sounds like. I'm bringing this up, I'm trying to work with the point that this looks like a, an impossible case, does it not? Does this child look like an impossible case to you? He's always been like this, he's going to stay like this. Let's see what happens. 
22, and oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. As the devil did for this child, he's trying to destroy his life. And the same thing the devil's trying to do today, destroy people's lives. But this man asked, we have compassion on us, we help us. And Jesus said to him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. We've heard it said, oh, he'll never get right. He'll never get right. I, I, God convicted me with this. If we continue to say people will never get right, we're just limiting God. Yes. You know that? I don't think it's a biblical thought. Sometimes we say that about people, oh, they'll never change, they'll never get right, and then we wonder why they never change and never get right. <laughs> I believe in a God that can still move mountains. I'm not a prosperity preacher. You know that about me. You know that I wouldn't just preach um, poppycock just to try to give us a warm, fuzzy feeling. I'm not. I just want. I think that God is looking though for servants who still believe He can work, Amen. who still believe He can do something big. Yes. If you go to God in prayer, praying for someone to get saved, but in the, your mind you really think that's never going to happen. God sees your heart. Yes. He's like, you don't have any faith. You're just running through the motions because you were told to run through the motions and pray for people. Do you actually believe? that I can convict this person's heart to change your life from a life of being in possession, doing the devil's bidding, to a life of accepting Christ and walking in the life. Do you believe it? God wants us to believe that he can work. You see it throughout Jesus' whole ministry. Amen. Where people had faith, he did marvelous things. Where people did no, had no faith, he did nothing and he moved on. He asked us to simply have faith. It's the same God we serve today. Believeth all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. Can't argue with scripture. 24. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. A better prayer was never spoken, was it? Help thou mine unbelief. I, I love that. It's so clear. You know our relationship with God and our prayer life with God just needs to be clear. We don't have to hide. Like when we talk to people, we have to like hide things and make sure we say it perfectly and make sure that they don't think too ill of us. Well, God knows everything about us anyway, so just open up. Yes. Say, hey, God, you just saw that sin I did. I really need to get out of that sin. I know it. I know I keep falling back into it, but I need you to help me get over this thing. Lord, somehow work a miracle in my life so I get out of that sin and stay out of that sin. Just a frank conversation with God. And here, I like praying for things that sometimes we don't think about. God, I need more faith. The preacher was talking about faith on Sunday. I am faithless. I don't know how to get it. You can't buy it. I can't go down the store and grab some. I need faith. Well, God, please give me faith. It's the same with all, all, the, all the things that God calls for us to do. Lord, I need more fear of you in my life. I haven't understood it. I wasn't raised with that as a concept. Lord, help me to fear your name. Unite my heart to fear that name. Yes. We need to ask God for what we need and believe that he can deliver I think we need to ask God for more than just our daily bread. And it's good. Ask God to supply your needs. But there are so many more needs we have in our lives, don't we? Yeah. Shortcomings in our lives. Well, I don't know. We need more grace. We said the word faith. We said fear. Long-suffering. Whatever it may be, ask God to give you that specifically. Ask God to work specifically. Here, this man says, Help thou my unbelief. 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together and rebuked, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, and he came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, the disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? Why could not we cast him out? And he said to them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. God gave the disciples a lot of power. They were casting out demons. They were. I mean, God gave them special power at that time. They were doing miracles in their own right. But this one, I think he put there on purpose. To show that, you know what you need to lean on ultimately when miracles are at your fingertips? I mean, that you're performing what you need to lean on is what I'm going to ask the, the, all the New Testament saints to lean on, is prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. We actually talked about fasting on Wednesday night. 
It's biblical. The way to understand it, though, is to simply that you're praying so much in your life that you're passing up food. It's the best way to apply it. Best way to apply it. You're busy seeking God's face that all of a sudden your worldly um, wants and desires and needs are second fiddle because you're seeking God's face. Prayer and fasting. Let us be a people that ask God to help our unbelief. I think if we do that, then we are setting ourselves up ready to be used. Ready to be used. I'll recap before we close. Do we want God to use us? Do we want to be meet for the Master's use? Do we want to be prepared for any and every good work? We need to forsake sin in our own way that we thought was right and good and smart. We need to feast upon God's Word. Don't starve yourself during the week. Obey the Spirit of God when it's clearly telling you what to do. Clearly telling you what to do. And don't think that that compelling, that Spirit will always be there. Right now, God may be telling you about salvation. You need to comply. Right now, God may be telling you for an action in your life. Well, call upon while He's near. Get it right right now. And then you know you, you follow God's Spirit. Right when He's talking to you clearly. And then finally, I think the one that, that really spoke to my heart in my personal study is to have faith in who God is. You do those things, I think we're set up to be used by God in a mighty way, just as God used Isaiah. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the Scriptures.